Hi, I'm Scott Simker. And I'm Amanda Mullen. Welcome to this chilly edition of Iowa Outdoors. On this edition of Iowa Outdoors, we'll go upstream with a group of paddlers who aren't willing to put their kayaks away for the winter. We go airborne to discover how the Iowa DNR manages the state's deer population. Chef John Benedict will share a recipe for venison that we're sure will appeal to everyone's taste buds. And we spend some time with the Emmy Award winning wildlife cinematographer Neil Reddick. We'll have that and more, so sit tight, stay warm, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reap Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. We are here at the Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge in Jasper County. You may have heard the expression, it'll take an act of Congress to get something done. Well, it really did in 1990 when Congress created this Central Iowa Refuge. Named for a nature-conscious Iowa congressman, the refuge recreated native plant and animal communities that existed in Central Iowa prior to 1840. While it might look like a frozen tundra this time of year, the refuge is actually over 5,000 acres of tall grass prairie and oak savanna. There are over eight miles of hiking trails, and if you're looking to try something a little different, why not snowshoe? If you're willing to brave the cold temperatures, the Prairie Learning Center offers programs and snowshoes to get you out on the prairie this time of year. And if you're up for that, perhaps you should join a group of paddlers who scoff at freezing temperatures just so they can spend more time on the water. The philosophy of the cold water kayakers is not only is it good for the body, but it's good for the soul. Sub-freezing temperatures can quickly turn Iowa's rivers and streams from inviting destinations into petrifying cauldrons of icy water. The thought of dipping into 40 degrees or colder river water sends chills down the spines of even the most seasoned outdoorsmen and women. But for the well-prepared paddler, it's some of the most serene kayaking of the entire year. Especially in the wintertime, it is so peaceful, it is so tranquil. Um, you're never supposed to paddle alone, of course, in the winter. But if you go out with a couple of people and you're just nature watching, what you can see is uh, just, a, just a ton of wildlife. Those quiet moments on the river are very healthy mentally. And uh, you, you really can't get that anywhere else. You can't get it on a bike trail. You can't get it on a hiking trail. There's just stuff on a water trail and on rivers and lakes uh, that you can't see anywhere else. Wind-swept water trails like the Des Moines River in central Iowa are often the best spot in the entire state for a front row seat at nature's buffet line. Clusters of bald eagles, concentrated by a dwindling supply of open water, give kayakers a show while scooping stunned fish from the water surface. and the vantage points that you can get to take pictures of the eagles and to spend a little time with them, it's pretty cool. Taking in the sights and sounds, a group of hardcore winter paddlers generate a lot of body heat trekking upstream and back down. But retaining that warmth is always a challenge. It's currently 30 degrees outside. I can't imagine how cold it is out on the water. So how do you keep warm when you're winter kayaking? Definitely layers, layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, I start with a, with a, a bottommost layer next to my skin of probably propylene underwear. Outer layer is a dry suit. It's um, 
made of Gore-Tex. And underneath that is a one-piece fleece that goes down to my feet. And underneath that is a smart wool. And underneath that is just the long underwear. I've got my splash jacket on, which seals at the cuffs. Also seals around the neck. It's not as good as a dry suit. This is to kind of keep the water out. It's, it's a seal that just Velcros on. I think it's pretty cool out here. What do you do to keep warm? What's the secret? Uh, secret is layering. Definitely layering. And uh, I have on a uh, polypropylene layer against my skin um, that wicks moisture away from the skin so it keeps you feeling a lot drier and more comfortable. And um, you don't, I have no cotton on whatsoever, not a thread, because cotton, if it gets wet, doesn't insulate. These, they're pogies, and they keep the cold water off your hands. You put your hand right in there. They work pretty well at keeping you warm. Oh, I don't even know. I don't even know if I could paddle in the winter without these. Yeah. They're essential. While staying warm is a huge concern for these kayakers, one of the biggest challenges is just trying to find open water. Iowa Outdoors joined kayakers on the Des Moines River below dams at Red Rock Reservoir and Salaville Lake. Both groups kept their distance from the dam's powerful output, but stayed close enough to see fish that were stunned by the passing of the dam's current bob towards the surface as eagle bait. For these kayakers, the stark beauty of Iowa's winter is front and center. As long as you dress for the occasion, and more importantly, you step outside to enjoy it. Hardcore paddlers only, uh, the ones that definitely want to paddle all year, all year round. And uh, it's a good way to keep conditioned. It's better than sitting around at home watching TV and gaining weight, eating junk. So uh, it's much better being out here, being a part of nature. At one time, the American bison or buffalo roamed wild across the Midwest in numbers too great to count. But overly aggressive hunting practices pushed the American bison to the brink of extinction in the 19th century. Today, you only find buffalo on ranches that raise them for their hide or meat, and on reserves in national parks, like the ones found here at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. Like buffalo, white-tailed deer in Iowa were also nearly hunted to extinction. In 1936, it was estimated that the size of the deer population in Iowa was only 500 to 700 animals. Today, it's estimated that our state is home to over 200,000 deer, thanks in large part to herd management practices adopted by the Iowa DNR. The growing wind of helicopter propellers is a familiar tune for some of Iowa's wildlife biologists. Every winter, after a fresh coat of snow, DNR deer specialists take to the air for a mathematical exercise in herd management. We're just we're looking for, for deer, quite simply. Uh, we, we survey the same areas every year. Uh, we do it best we can at the same uh, speed, altitude, under the same weather conditions, if we can. The aerial surveys on a statewide basis, we, we, we do aerial trend surveys on approximately um, 350 areas um, throughout the state. Um, they're one of five different trend surveys that we utilize in the state. Tom Litchfield is one of the DNR deer program biologists tasked with estimating Iowa's herd population and developing hunting recommendations for public review. Alongside depredation specialist Bill Binger, Tom's task seems simple to count every deer you see from a bird's eye view. You learn sh um, sh images to search for, and, and depending on if, if the sun's out or if it's cloudy, um, different color patterns and things like that. Um, obviously, when we're doing these aerial surveys, it's impossible to see, see every deer. Um, and I think if most people tried it, they'd find out that, that seeing deer from the air, even though that it seems like it would be real easy. It, it definitely takes an, takes an eye and, and some time to develop a knack for it. Tom and Bill emphasize that aerial deer surveys are only a sliver of the overall herd estimations. DNR specialists gather roadkill data from the Iowa DOT. They count salvage tags. They also conduct spring spotlight surveys, and they compile harvest numbers from annual deer hunts. Those hunting seasons account for nearly 90% of the mortalities in Iowa's white-tailed deer. Which leads the average Iowan to wonder, 
Is it as simple as having too many or too little deer? It's not that simple, but that is how you have to look at it. And so what we as a department have to try to do, the Department of Natural Resources, is, is balance that deer resource in amongst a lot of, of um, social opinions that are often in direct conflict with each other. Iowa DNR deer counts have reached some interesting conclusions, sometimes contrary to popular belief. Many Iowans believe that the state's deer population has grown exponentially in recent years, but... That would be incorrect. Um, the, the deer herd has actually been declining now for the last several years. Um, it's, it's looking like this spring when all the analyses are completed that the deer herd will, will be real close on a statewide basis to, to being back down to the mid to late 1990s levels. Despite DNR data showing a population peak in 2006, Iowans suffering from missing backyard gardens may find it hard to believe. But one protected neighborhood doesn't resemble an entire state. Deer have adapted to living around people, and, and if they have a place where they can have cover food and water and not get shot at, then, then that's a place they, they'll tend to, to like to stay around. Numerous Iowa cities and municipalities have adopted population control measures like limited bow hunts. Data from this aerial survey of Four Mile Creek in central Iowa could help DNR specialists and local officials determine if their controlled archery hunts are working. Real important for us. It's, it's, it's the only way we're going to know. It, it helps us target not only what's going on across the area as a trend, but it helps us look at some of the areas a little closer and pinpoint some of the, the more problem areas and where they may or may not be as quite as effective with the hunt, for example. That accuracy is just one arrow in the quiver of data gathering for the Iowa DNR. Next season's deer hunt may have a lot to do with a handful of airborne specialists, counting one by one. In many circles, deer meat isn't considered a delicacy. But in this episode of Iowa Outdoors, Chef John Benedict shares a delicious recipe for venison stew. And we're confident that even those palates not partial to venison will find it very tasty. Hi, I'm Chef John Benedict. In the kitchen, we're gonna be cooking up some venison stew. I got some wonderful fresh venison here that I've cubed up into about one inch pieces. And I'm gonna go ahead and season it with a little bit of pepper, garlic powder, a little oregano and thyme. Mix it with just a little bit of flour so it'll help thicken our stew in the end. And we're gonna go ahead and mix all this up and get ready to sear it in our Dutch oven that we have on the stove top. Our Dutch oven now is nice and hot on our stove top. I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple tablespoons of oil to sear off our venison that we have. You know, I like using this Dutch oven style for a couple reasons. One, it holds its temperature very well. And for the second reason, it's gonna go right from the stove top into the oven very easily. I'm gonna go ahead and add all my venison meat that's been seasoned and has the flour with it. And I'm gonna go ahead and brown it on all sides. While I'm browning it, I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of tomato paste and about a tablespoon or two of chopped garlic. And I'm just gonna stir all this up and sear this meat off on all sides. So we got all our venison meat here searing in our Dutch oven with our tomato paste and chopped garlic. And you might have noticed that some of the stuff will be sticking to the bottom of this Dutch oven, but that's okay, because now that our meat's all brown on all the edges, we're gonna go ahead and add about a cup of red wine right to the pot, and it'll help loosen up all the stuff on the bottom of it. I'm just gonna let it simmer for a couple minutes in order to loosen any of the flavorings that's been stuck to the bottom of the Dutch oven. Once that's kind of simmered and reduced a little bit, I'm gonna add a mixture of chopped parsnips, onions, celery, and carrots, a couple bay leaves right on top. I'm gonna add a couple cups of beef stock. And I'm gonna add one can of a diced tomato. I'll incorporate all this Stir it all up so it's mixed up real nice. And I'll cover the lid up. And I'm gonna put it right into my oven at 350 degrees for about an hour, hour and a half to cook. About 20 minutes before our venison stew was done, I went ahead and put in a batch of this jalapeno cornbread. It's an excellent side item to go with our venison stew. In this jalapeno cornbread, I put in some jalapenos, red peppers, and roasted corn. And it goes real well with this venison stew. 
Oh, this venison stew just smells excellent. And we're gonna check to see how tender the meat is by just pulling up a piece and pushing it with our spoon along the edge of this Dutch oven here and it should just fall right apart. And it does. This is an excellent venison stew to serve on a cold day. I'm Chef John Benedict. Thanks for coming to my kitchen to cook up some venison stew. The wintertime blues can keep many Iowans from enjoying the great outdoors. The same can be said for our furry four-legged friends who don't get the necessary exercise. But one South Central Iowa dog owner howls a different tune. Alongside a pack of Siberian Huskies, this Iowan recreates the Alaskan countryside in our own backyard. Amidst the gently rolling hills of South Central Iowa rests a canine oasis. A trail mostly traveled by groups of summertime bikers transforms into a tree-lined and snow-covered highway for one of winter's most popular dogs, the Siberian Husky. Ginger Plummer runs Howling Hills Canine Campus, a dog boarding and grooming operation near Cumming. But her true passion lies in her sled dogs and the crisp air of an Iowa winter. And we were lucky enough to join Ginger and her team for a dash down the Great Western Trail. What things should I keep in mind, or, you know, <laughs> since I've never done this before? Actually, more just steering the st sled and keep it behind the dogs. All I have to do is tell you which way to lean, mostly. That's about the only thing you'll have to do. Okay. <laughs> so I need to know my rights and lefts, pretty much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Ginger's huskies could hardly control themselves once their harnesses are set. The box and squeals aren't from pain, they just want to run. Hey. Let him go! Let him go! They take off really fast and it's like this quick little rush and then they slow down a little bit and it's just really nice and beautiful and all the snow. Couldn't ask for a more perfect day. Excitable sled dogs and their human cargo are a welcome wintertime image on the Great Western Trail. A small but passionate group of mushers haven't made Iowa dog sledding a widespread activity and it's certainly an import. Even the toughest Iowa winter pales in comparison to the frozen tundra of Alaska, where dog sledding lore traces back centuries to Eskimo tribes and the famed Iditarod sled race. But Iowa's dog sledding is not about records or crossing miles of frozen cornfields. It's time spent outdoors amongst family. We started out with one Siberian Husky, and then we acquired another one, and then we got another one, and it's like, hey, you know, maybe I can get a team going here, you know? It's, and it's something, you know, the dogs absolutely love doing it. So, I mean, it's you know, anything you can do to do something with them and, you know, everybody can enjoy it. It's a really good deal. Chris Byerhelm convinced his wife and two daughters to take up dog sledding alongside the family's three Siberian Huskies. The same dogs that curl up with Chris's wife, Tammy, and their daughters, Katie and Chrissy, on the family couch can also pull a pair of them down a mile-long section of the Great Western Trail. It's really good. It's, I mean, as long as you got snow and somewhere to do it, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, I just wish it snowed all year round so we could do it all the time. <laughs> Summer really puts a, a damper in that. But corralling all the dogs, sled, and harnesses isn't easy. It takes a few helpful hands. It's very family friendly. <laughs> it's actually, it's, I mean, without my daughters and my wife coming out helping me, I mean, it'd be very difficult to do. I mean, you guys seen hooking all the dogs up and they're so excited to go. You, all the extra hands always helps out. It may not be the first winter activity that comes to mind during Iowa's coldest months, but it's one of our most underutilized and serene ways to rediscover the state's snow-covered trails. Hey, Chris, go, go, go! Good girl! Good girl, let's go! Uh, well, one, I couldn't believe how quiet the dogs got, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful, and like the wind in your face, and it was just amazing. It's cool, it's just, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, you just gotta do it. Over the past three decades, Neil Reddick has contributed to the productions of hundreds of films, including IMAX productions, National Geographic specials, and the PBS series Nature. Recognized as one of the world's premier wildlife photographers, Neil has received many awards, including three Emmys. And while his work takes him all over the planet, he lives right here in the Midwest, and two of his films, American Eagle and Raptor Force, were filmed largely in Iowa. This project is uh, three one-hour shows 
on the Mississippi River, starting all the way up in Lake Itasca and all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is going to be dynamic with uh, capturing a lot of the really interesting action that happens, both with predation and with people that are out using the river, like these commercial fishermen that are netting under the ice, which is a unique uh, fishing method that really hasn't been documented that much. Neil Reddick's camera work has been featured in more than 100 nature films over nearly four decades. His first major project was shooting harpy eagles on the Amazon River in 1974. However, his earlier work did not involve any of the world's natural wonders. My real first project when I was 14 years old was making monster movies at home with my parents' 8mm camera. Since then, Neil has shot from the Amazon to the Arctic in all sorts of environments and under all kinds of conditions. Every place we go is, is fascinating and you learn something different, you meet fantastic people, you see amazing wildlife in action, it's, it's awesome. On this shoot, temperatures are hovering right around freezing. It's not only hard on the body, but it's also hard on the equipment. Before he's finished for the day, Neil will have spent 10 hours on this frozen stretch of Mississippi River trying to capture the fish harvest. A lot of patience you need for this kind of work. Uh, right now, I mean, we're dealing with just th this kind of chaos of these guys with the system they have for getting them out into the water. Mostly with wildlife, I'm just sitting in a blind and waiting for, you know, often many, many hours the whole day, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes even months to get some particular behavior of, a, of, a, of an animal. In the end, when you, when you do finally get something uh, spectacular, it's worth the wait. Reddick was co-producer and cinematographer for the documentary American Eagle, which premiered on the PBS program Nature in 2008. Often, the cinematography was breathtaking, and at times, it was heartbreaking. It's not unusual for the older eaglet to turn on the younger and smaller. Reddick says when filming Nature, it's important to know the behavioral patterns of the animal being filmed, it's also of the utmost importance that you do not interfere. Often there's really emotional things that happen when you're in the field. Uh, sometimes it's predation, where you're watching a predator uh, take down an animal. And in the case of bald eagles, we are actually uh, witnessing what's called the Cain and Abel syndrome, where one of the older eaglets was picking on a slightly smaller and younger one. And it was just awful. I mean, I, I, I really felt like intervening, climbing up the tree and taking the, the young chick that was being beat up by its sibling out to save it. Of course, you can't do that, but uh, you gotta just record what you see and not let emotions take over. The eaglet did survive the abuse it suffered from its sibling. The nest in the documentary was located at the fish hatchery in Decora, Iowa. Neil estimated that around 50% of American Eagle was shot in Iowa. He says that roughly 30% of another nature program he worked on entitled Raptor Force also was shot in Iowa. In the film, Reddick actually attached a camera to the back of a bird of prey. Today, everybody wants something different. They want uh, different perspectives, different angles, point of view shots. and. We've actually been perfecting different ways to put cameras on, for example, on the back of a peregrine falcon. They give you such a unique angle that you feel what it's like to actually be in the air or be a part of a flock. Neil would encourage anyone who is interested in filmmaking to not let anyone else tell you it's impossible. If you can put up with sweltering heat, sub-zero temperatures, and survive the countless insects that want a piece of you, filming nature can be rewarding. I think the most rewarding thing that I find is giving people insight into the beauty of the natural world. Uh, when I can uh, produce something that makes people realize how wonderful some, an animal is or how important it is to save an ecosystem and an environment, that's, that's the most rewarding for sure. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. We're gonna leave you with some more images of eagles on the Des Moines River. But before we do, we'd like to encourage you to visit the Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge, where there are plenty of things to see and do for the entire family. 
and make sure while you're there to visit the Prairie Education Center. For information on programs and activities, check out their website at tallgrass.org. Hey, Scott, did you know that Tallgrass Prairie covered 85% of Iowa's 36 million acres, and now only 0.1% of that prairie remains? Yeah? Wow. I don't think you actually knew that. I did know that. No, you didn't. Everybody knows You're that. A liar. Oh, whatever. You don't know. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reef Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. <laughs>